All right, welcome everyone. Thanks for coming to my talk today. Um, my name is Dave Bogle. Uh, currently a security researcher at Red Canary. And today, uh, my goal with this talk was to be able to tell a story, right? Probably not as cool as Jeff presided a story this morning, uh, but I do help to share a story that will be helpful for all of you, uh, especially those who are either in cloud security right now, who are maybe thinking about getting into cloud security, or who are just still trying to figure out their security journey in general and don't really know what they want to do yet. So what I hope to talk about today is my experience going from uh, an endpoint researcher in security to cloud, which for me was a very big change. Uh, and there was a lot of lessons learned that I took from that that I hope I can share with some of you who are you know, starting your journey in the cloud. So uh, my role at the Red Canary is I'm our Linux threat researcher. Uh, I also spend a lot of time looking, a lot of time looking into Kubernetes and GCP and Google Workspace and uh, other cloud services. I love riding bikes, road bike, mountain bike, uh, biking with my kids. And of course, you know, I've got three kids, so I had to put a Bluey reference up there because that's like the greatest show ever for both adults and kids. Uh, very entertaining. So, uh, Next talk, I'm going to talk about uh, why there's been so much interest in the cloud, right? Why are we talking about it? Uh, it's been around for a while now, but probably only within the last decade or so has it really started to see a lot of growth, right? The businesses have been moving very rapidly into the cloud, and I want to talk about why that is, right? And what it offers to businesses. And then I also want to talk about, okay, if you want to be a security researcher and do security in the cloud, what do you need to know? And for those who maybe have already, you know, gotten their feet wet and done a little cloud research already, I'm hoping to provide uh, maybe a few examples of some things that will help continue that journey of research. And where some things that I learned is I very quickly had to learn uh, all the deep in intricacies of how the cloud worked. And then finally, um, I want to talk about sort of, you know, the trajectory and beyond, right? So once you're already in the cloud, you're doing great, you're learning awesome stuff, you're securing all the things, how do you continue to grow? in that research, right? And how do you take it even further to uh, continue to protect your organizations or further whatever research you find interesting? So to start off, uh, why are we talking about the cloud? Well, like I said before, I come from a background of very low level uh, security research, right? So I love bits and bytes and assembly and C code. That's my favorite language to program in. So why am I talking about cloud security? Well, I worked at a company that uh, is trying to uh, get into cloud research, right? And offer products that protect customers' cloud environments. And so being one of the threat researchers, they're like, hey, you should go learn cloud and then help us build a product around that. And I said, sure, <laughs> of course. Easy peasy, right? Uh, it wasn't that easy, right? It, it was a pretty painful experience for a while. And that's hopefully a lot of what I'll be able to share with you is what I learned and, and how I overcame some of those struggles. But like it or not, a lot of businesses are moving to the cloud. All right, some are entirely cloud native, right, where the core of their business operations exist in some cloud provider. And others are just sort of toying with the idea, right, where maybe they have some on-prem stuff still, but they have some of their services offered in the cloud. But either way, it seems like a large majority of companies are starting to push resources and business operations into the cloud. And why did they do that? Uh, there's a lot of reasons. Uh, some would be ease of deployment. Right? So you can reliably and very easily deploy very complex infrastructure into the cloud. Uh, rapid prototyping. So if they're just trying to test out a new product, maybe they want to build it in the cloud first, see how it works, and then consider whether, they not, whether or not they want to host it in the cloud and maybe on-prem. Uh, it allows you to very easily deploy things globally. So if you have a global customer base, right, the cloud can help with a lot of aspects of dealing with that. And then finally, uh, one thing that I advocate for is I think, and this is maybe a hot take, but I think that cloud platforms by like inherently are more securable than uh, on-prem stuff, right? And I get that a lot of people may have different opinions about that. We can talk offline if you want to get into the details. Totally fine with me. Um, but I think there's a lot of security benefits to hosting services in the cloud, right? But that's a, a talk for another day, maybe. So cloud's the future, right? Want to do all things cloud. Uh, sort of. So I feel like I had to put this in here because as I've been researching the cloud over the last few years, I've noticed that not all companies agree with that. So I just want to put it out there that cloud doesn't work for every business, 
right? Some businesses find it easier or more cost-effective to host things themselves. Uh, that said, right, despite all these headlines talking about, you know, all these companies leaving the cloud, uh, we've seen cloud sales and profits rise phenomenally over the last decade, and they're continuing to rise, which in my mind is pointing to the fact that there are still lots of people and probably even a majority of businesses uh, and people moving their stuff into the cloud and paying money to cloud providers to host services. All right, so let's talk about uh, getting into the cloud. So I covered a couple of these already. Uh, I'm not gonna talk about each one, but these are a few of probably the biggest reasons cited by companies as to why they wanna move to the cloud, right? And every business may have different reasons for doing so. I think this touches on a lot of them, um, but I'm not gonna dive into each one of those, but there's that for reference. So now I wanna talk about how the cloud works uh, at kind of a high level, right? And the reason I wanna do this is because I wanna sort of paint the landscape as to different areas of cloud research that you might get into. And when we think about cloud research, you have to think about all of the different attack vectors that an adversary might have on a cloud environment. And I think it begins with uh, a computer, right? So it could be your personal laptop, if you're a cloud developer, or maybe you're a security engineer, Right, you have your own computer, it has credentials, it has access to that cloud environment, and that computer has to make requests to the cloud. Those requests go across the internet, right? and we'll just pretend it's the magical internet that just somehow gets your packets to the cloud. Your packets then reach the cloud provider, wherever that might be, you know, AWS, Azure, GCP, and then once it gets there, then it's routed to whatever specific resource you're interacting with in the cloud, right? So maybe it's your uh, SQL database, your cloud storage, your cloud functions, Lambda, you know, whatever it might be. So let's look at each one of those pieces one by one and look at how some of that access occurs, right, in that full pipeline from the beginning. So starting with your computer, right, there's a lot of different ways that you can initiate that request. Some of the most common ones uh, is maybe you do it through your browser, right? You log in to the cloud provider's console, you click a bunch of buttons, you provision VMs, uh, Kubernetes clusters, storage buckets, whatever it might be, and you're doing all that through a browser. Another way you could do it, and my preferred way, uh, is you can do it through a CLI tool, right? So AWS, G Cloud, AZ, uh, you can you know, more programmatically interact with it through that way. You could also use the myriad of third-party tools that exist that are leveraging SDKs the cloud providers have built. So if you want to use your favorite um, you know, third-party tool, they might be pulling in some software libraries to help them interact with the cloud. So maybe some less common ways, uh, curl. It's a great way to do it. I use that uh, more often than I would have thought I would have. Uh, but sometimes you just want to just hit it with like a straight uh, get or post request or whatever, and you need to be able to customize uh, that command a bit more. Or, you know, at the end of the day, interacting with those cloud providers are just API calls. So you can use whatever programming language you, you like and just you know, send a request via an API call and you can interact with that cloud provider. So there's lots of different ways you can do that. Uh, the way you actually get access though is you're gonna have some kind of credential on your machine that's gonna be used to authenticate and authorize you to access those resources, right? And we'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. All right, so where do those packets go once you send a request? Well, at a high level, um, when you make an API request, uh, and I have an example of a command down there using gcloud, if you were to, let's say, provision a new VM instance, what the G Cloud tool is going to do is basically just format uh, an HTTP request, right? In this case, it's probably going to be a post, and you're going to post to some URL endpoint that's hosted by the cloud provider. And so that packet, just like any other HTTP request, is going to go through the internet. It's going to hit one of the edge routers for whatever cloud provider, and then that will analyze it and route it to whatever the appropriate services that you're trying to interact with. Right, in this case, virtual compute. So let's dive a bit deeper into the part of once that packet hits the cloud provider, what happens? Right, well, you've got an authentication phase, right, and that's the act of validating that the user sending that packet is who they say they are. Then you have an authorization phase, which is making sure that that user is allowed to do what they want to do. Then there's a validation step, right, where you actually have to make sure that request is valid. And then finally, you have the execution of that request, which could include rejecting it if uh, it's decided that um, that shouldn't be allowed or accepting it and then provisioning the resource or changing it or whatever that request happens to do. So if we were to break this down, uh, our packet makes it into the cloud provider's environment. 
and we hit the authorization phase. And so at this point, this is where we're looking into technologies like OAuth 2.0, bearer tokens, uh, JOTs, JWTs, and kind of all of the things related to that, right? And that's where it's just trying to determine, are you who you say you are? Can I verify your identity, right, as whatever user you claim to be? Assuming that you pass that check, you then go to the author authorization phase. And at that point, uh, you, it then looks at the IAM policies, right? Or the roles or the OAuth scopes that you might have applied to your access token. And they will make a decision, the cloud provider, as to whether or not you're allowed to uh, interact with that resource. So they know who you are and they say, okay, well, you know, Dave Bogle uh, has verified his identity. Now is he allowed to spin up a new virtual machine or write something to a storage bucket or interact with the Kubernetes cluster, right? And that's where those checks will happen. And then finally, you have a validation step, right? And this is where we're looking at policy. So you might have organizational policies that uh, even though a user uh, is who they say, the roles that they uh, need to to interact with the resource, there may be overriding policies that then block that request, potentially. Uh, and so there's policy checks that happen, uh, format checks, resource validation, so making sure the resources they want to interact with actually exist. And then finally, after all that work, uh, your request can make it to whatever service you were trying to interact with. So there's a lot of steps that go in there, and there's a lot of cool research that can be done uh, during any one of those phases, right? So that's uh, just yet another avenue of cloud research that you could potentially get into, where each one of those technologies, right, OAuth 2, uh, IAM, OAuth scopes, organizational policies, all those things uh, can be deep and enriching uh, fields of research. So how do we become fluent in the cloud? Well, I think the very first thing, and this is probably the hardest thing for me, is it's like learning another language, right? When I first got in the cloud, people were just throwing all these words around that I didn't understand, right? Uh, principles, permissions, roles, scopes, um, RBAC, right? All these things that I was not familiar with. And so it was very hard to keep up with some of the stuff I was trying to read and understand if I didn't have a good foundational understanding of the vocabulary. So one of the first things I did was I just went and said, okay, let me find sort of the cloud buzzword, right? That pertain to cloud security. And I'm just going to dive into each one of those and make sure that I understand it really well. And I even took the time to understand it across the different cloud providers because each cloud provider will sort of have their own dialect and their own meaning attached to some of these words. And so I actually made uh, like some notes where I had like AWS, Azure, GCP. And I was like, in AWS, this thing is called that. But in Azure, they call it this. And in GCP, they call it something else. But it's all basically the same technology, right? And that was helpful for me to build that mapping to kind of bridge those concepts as I was bouncing around cloud providers. Can I shoot? <laughs> Uh, maybe, actually. Um, we can talk more about that later. Uh, but yeah, so they, they all have a common language that they speak, but then each of them have their own dialect, right? And that's one of the hard things when you're trying to move between cloud providers. And the tricky thing is, is in the past few years, companies have really been liking the idea of multi-cloud deployments, which then becomes really hard for us as security researchers because you're like, not only do I need to understand AWS, which has over 200 services, each of which can be very complex, and have a huge threat landscape, but now you want me to do that in Azure, and then you want me to do it in how they interact with each other, and how they share identities between each other, and all that, and it just gets really messy really quick, right? So trying to build that foundation and understanding of the different services and the different vocabulary can be helpful for bridging those concepts and quickly pivoting between cloud environments. So it definitely takes some time to understand uh, the language of each cloud provider uh, and some of their you know, unique words. So I listed out a few here that I remember spending some time really digging into. Um, again, I'm not gonna go through each one of them, but you know, if there's some of these that you see that you're like, oh, I don't even know what that means, uh, go take some time, research it. Tons of great blog posts out there, lots of good materials uh, for every single one of these, right? And but remember, the caveat is, it may mean one thing in AWS, it might mean a different thing in GCP. So you gotta make sure that you're understanding that in the right frame of mind. Um, all right, once there was a reference. So how do we get into cloud security fast, right? Because nobody wants to spend a long time, uh, you know, learning each thing. We've got lots of things to do, meetings to go to, cool tools to build. So here's a few of the tips uh, that I felt helped me 
get up and running very quickly, right? And this came from my background as an endpoint researcher where I often was tasked with, hey, you need to dive into this concept. And I had to learn it really fast and in depth as quickly as I could. Uh, so first, uh, don't be afraid to just get your hands dirty, right? And I think back to uh, Dave Kennedy's keynote yesterday where he said, just do it, right? Just get into a cloud environment, start provisioning stuff, start playing around, and just get your hands dirty, right? Get in the cloud. And you'll learn so fast by doing that. But from what I've seen is I've uh, helped other people in my company also get into cloud security. People seem to be very hesitant to just get into a cloud environment and spin something up because they're like, what if I break something? What if I end up costing our company $10,000 because I spun up some super fancy VM with a huge GPU on it and it's just costing a lot of money? I mean, that's probably not going to happen, right? More often than not, you'll get in there, you'll spin up some resources, and you'll learn a ton by trying stuff that you thought was going to work, and then it totally doesn't work. It happened to me all the time, where I was like, you know what, I know all about cloud functions and GCP. Like, I'm an expert. And then I'm like, okay, I'm going to spin one up, and I'm going to tie it to, like, uh, a storage bucket. I want something to read from that storage bucket and do a pub sub event for, you know, when something's written. When I actually got in there to try and provision all that, I realized I had no idea what I was doing. So like conceptually, I understood it all, but practically I couldn't do it. And so that was an eye opener for me that like, I just got to get in there. And when I'm learning about these things, I need to actually be using the CLI or using the console to be spinning up these resources and playing around with them. And you'll learn so much just by doing that. Now that said, you do have to read the manuals. Sorry, I apologize. There's no way around it though. Uh, generally though, the documentation is actually pretty good for a lot of these cloud providers, uh, which I don't say that lightly, um, cause I've read a lot of great documentation. I've read lots more terrible documentation and my experience has been, it's actually pretty good. Um, so definitely don't be afraid to get in there, uh, and to understand, you know, what they're offering in terms of insights. They oftentimes will have lots of practical guides as like, Hey, if you want to build this thing, here's a quick tutorial on how to do it. It'll walk you through the steps, talk about some of the configuration options, and that can be really helpful. Uh, specifically focus on the security side of things, uh, study what's already available. So there are lots of good red team tools that you can look into if you want to understand sort of the offensive uh, cloud security stuff. There's tons of great talks given at many conferences uh, about lots of different cloud topics. So search around YouTube, Google, find some talks that you really like, uh, and you know dig into specific subjects based on that because there's a lot, a lot of good content out there. Um, and then another thing that I like to do and I like to remember as I'm getting into cloud security and researching something is make sure you stand back and look at the big picture. And what I mean by that is the cloud is just someone else's computer, right? So don't forget that. When you're making these API requests, right, even though that's maybe your only way to interact with some service, there is just an HTTP server on the other end listening to these requests, processing them, and then probably spinning up some container, or, you know, something like that to then provision some resource or change it, right? But keeping that big picture in mind, I think helps frame how you want to find new areas to investigate. And some of the coolest research I've seen has been, you know, when people understand that like behind these fancy UIs in the browser and behind these CLI tools that do HTTP requests are just virtual machines that are running by this cloud provider. Uh, and there's a lot of interesting stuff that you can dig into that way. But it also just helps frame uh, how you're picturing the threat landscape. And then finally, uh, if you are interested in it, certification and training programs, uh, there's like a million of them out there, so I'm not gonna recommend any particular one, but there's lots of good stuff out there uh, if that's the route you wanna go down that are great programs and will teach you a lot of the, the basics. Now, a couple pitfalls to be aware of. Uh, security research in the cloud is not security research on endpoint. Uh, that was one of the hardest lessons for me to learn is I wanted to treat it like I was doing endpoint research, like I was looking into an operating system or something. And I couldn't do that. Like, it just wasn't the same. As much as I wanted it to be, and I was trying to, like, bring parallels between the two, it's just not the same. So go into it with an open mindset if you're coming from a background in NPOI research, right? Uh, it's going to be different. That's okay. Uh, it's interesting in its own ways, right? And there's new problems solving that just don't exist on endpoint. Uh, in the cloud, any single, you know, audit event that you might see or event that occurs, typically is not going to be enough to do something actionable from like a detection perspective, right? So if you want to tell a story about something that happened, right? If there was some compromise in a cloud environment, 
Uh, and you want to try and paint the picture of, you know, well, here's how they got it and here's what they did and here's all the things, right? Uh, that's going to be combining a lot of different information into one. And one of the things that's really hard in cloud research is figuring out what are the most important pieces of information for being able to tell a story about something that occurred in a cloud environment. And then finally, the last thing, and probably the most frustrating as a cloud researcher, is it just changes all the time. So one thing that I've started to integrate into some of my research is just watching those changes over time. So when I started looking into GCP, for example, there were, I think, about 8,000 or so unique permissions. Right? The last time I checked, and I have to go double check this, my data could be old, I think there was 11,000 permissions. Right? And so things are, and that was you know, not that long ago. Right? So it's uh, significantly changed over time. And some of the permissions that existed before have switched and changed as time has gone on. So that's just one example right, of just how the cloud's constantly evolving. And you don't necessarily have a nice like, release of, oh, hey, there is this new version that got released in the cloud. And now we know these things changed at that version mark. They just change, right? Things just change all the time. Uh, so that can be really tricky from a research perspective because you can't always assume that something you researched a year ago is still going to behave the same way that it does now, right? So a couple bits of advice. Uh, learn how to tell a story. So with so many different technologies that go into uh, the cloud and cloud security, you really have to bring in a lot of different information to tell that whole story to understand what happened or how something occurred. So learn how to tell that story and learn what pieces of information can help you build that picture in your mind of what uh, occurred in a cloud environment. I think the other big thing is identity is a key part of cloud. And you can't really do cloud security research without understanding identity to some degree. So you're definitely going to have to tackle that as part of research if you want to get into cloud security. And then finally, the last thing that I think is super helpful is understand how people use the cloud because it's always different, right? So if you're a researcher and you're just trying to secure your own company's uh, cloud assets, then understand how your engineers and how your customers and how your employees use those cloud assets. And that will help you focus your research on the things that will be most impactful. Uh, if you have the opportunity to uh, secure other customers' environments, work with them to understand what are the threats they're worried about, what are the problems they're facing, what do their environments look like, and again, that will help scope and focus your research. Because with any major cloud provider, and you've got 200 plus services, you just don't have that much time to dig deeply into each thing. Right? So make sure you understand how people are using it. Uh, last but not least, don't be afraid to experiment. I said that before, I'm just gonna say it again. Right? If you're trying to get into cloud security, just do it. Right? Every big cloud provider offers a free account. You can get some free credits. You can just get on there and start messing with stuff. Like, please, just do it. You will learn so much. And you may even find that like, it's not your thing. And that's okay too. Uh, and security is a team sport, right? Work with, uh, I mean, we're showing that here at this conference, right? As we're all working together to understand security better. And so, yeah, I love that there's so many of you who are interested in this. Um, and definitely don't be afraid to you know, reach out, talk with others, network, uh, work with people at your company to just build a better security product. And last but most least, or but not least, is learn to love to learn, right? And that's something that I uh, have learned as I've done research for the last 10 years and different things is you just have to learn to love the process of learning. And it's hard and it's painful and it sucks sometimes, right? And I, I didn't like cloud at first, I'll be honest, I'll say it, I'll admit it. Um, and it was really hard for me to make that switch. But as I got into it and as I just dug deep, I started finding things that I did like and some stuff that I found really interesting. And then I began to love the process of learning new things about the cloud and found a lot of new interesting things to look into. So with that, thank you all for coming to my talk. Appreciate it.